All right. Amen. Well, I am grateful to be here this morning. It's a, a great crowd to be able to come and preach to you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Pastor Menes and his family for uh, the hospitality and just for always putting this conference on. It's such an edifying event. Uh, I want to also thank uh, the Verity staff team. You know, you guys do a great job. You do a lot of work. I know it's not easy managing the uh, events and such. And I also want to thank all of you, again, for showing up. And again, if I haven't got to meet you, hopefully I get that opportunity after we're done this morning. I'd love to meet you and um, appreciate you. And I'm looking forward to hopefully giving you a good blessing this morning. Uh, so we are in John chapter number 13. Look at verse number 21. It says this, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting whom he spake. Now, you see what's going on here. They're having dinner, they're having a meal, and you know everything's going good. And Jesus is like, hey, by the way, someone's going to betray me. And they're just like, well, this isn't what we wanted to hear at all. And then they begin to wonder, like, well, who is it? Who's it going to be? You know, is it me? And you know, they start going through that process, you know, trying to figure out who it is. And the reason why they can't figure out who it is is because they haven't developed relational intelligence or relational discernment. The title of my sermon this morning is Relational Discernment. I know it's not as cool as Calvin and the Chipmunks, but sometimes these titles, they just, <laughs> you know, they just got to hit me like a ton of bricks and then I can go with it. But it'll work. Relational Discernment. And what this is about, it's it's about putting people in their place. You see, everybody in your life, everybody that you associate with has a proper place in your life, okay? Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not some new evangelical guy up here saying, you know, you have to treat everyone the exact same and you have to love everyone the exact same. That's not true. That's actually a myth, right? Just because somebody's a born again, Bible believing Christian soul winner, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get along with them. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are your true friend, right? I'm not even saying that they're bad, but they might be bad for you. There's all sorts of reasons why people aren't going to become close friends, right? But we have to manage the people in our lives. This is very, very important. Um, so again, this is about the ability. You say, well, what is relational intelligence? It's the ability to proper are to properly align the people in your life. And you're going to see why this is so important. It's so important because when you misalign people in your life, okay, what often happens is you start to misplace expectations on those people. And what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for failure, okay? You're setting yourself up for failure, for frustration, which often leads to bitterness, so we need to keep that in mind. Now, keep your place there in John 13, because we're going to come right back to it, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. So, for this sermon, we're going to talk about three groups of people, okay? We're going to talk about friends, and by friends, I mean true friends. We're going to define that, what that is, what that means, and I'll just tell you right off the bat, these are going to be the people that are probably the least out of all three. You're always going to have fewer true friends than you will have the next category, which I'm going to call friendlies, okay? And by friendlies, what I mean are people that, you know, are your co-laborers, your co-workers, your extended family, people that have maybe the same goals that you have, people that you see often, people that you even love, people that you even care about, okay? Uh, but they're not necessarily your close friends. So, a friend, okay, there's obviously, there needs to be the same balance. There needs to be this reciprocation, okay? It needs to be mutual. But, you know, with our associates, our acquaintances, our coworkers and stuff, it's an unbalanced relationship. We're going to talk about that. And then the third category, which is, you know, my pet peeve, are the frenemies. You know, the frenemies, right? The guys that are always about this close to getting kicked out of church. The guys that, you know, they, 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 they know how to play the game really well. You know what I'm talking about? They know how to say the right things. They know how to take the right jabs, you know, and they leave themselves like a little back door. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't really mean that, right? And then when you call them out, they're like, oh, well, was it me? Was it me you were talking about? No, I was talking about your uncle. <laughs> I wasn't talking about you. And it's like, you know, even if I told you I was talking about you half the time, our frenemies, they don't get it. It's right over the head. That's usually what happens. But you know, for the time being, obviously, we're born-again, Bible-believing Christians, 
right? We want to hopefully pray for these people. We want to edify these people. Hopefully, you know, that we, we always want to uh, try to get restoration as a possibility, right? Hopefully we want to restore these people, move them up the ladder, at least to the, the, the friendly category and so on, right? But the problem with friendlies, the problem with really the frenemies is you don't know which way they're going to go. They're kind of like goats, you know? Frenemies are kind of like goats, right? Goats are good. You know, you can get milk, you can get meat off of them. You know, to your face, they're friendly. But when you turn around, they might just decide to ram you. <laughs> they're like those ghosts on the original Mario Brothers I used to play when I was a kid. You know, when you, you're walking, you know, Mario down the pathway or whatever, and you turn around and the ghost stops. You know, that's how frenemies are. And, they, you know, and they're, they're always going to be among us, right? But we have to learn how to manage these people because they can be extremely, as you know, extremely, extremely frustrating, okay? And so, yes, this sermon is kind of a chest dump for me this morning as well. So just bear with me, all right? It's, it's, it's always something, all right? It's always something like this. So you're there in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to show you again why this is so important. Look at verse number 33. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 33. It says this, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You know what the scary part about this verse is? That when you have so many different people in your life and you don't know how to manage them, it's possible for you to not even be aware of how they are corrupting you. Now go back to John chapter 13 and I'll show you an example of this. So this has already been taking place amongst the disciples. Judas has already begun the evil communications. In fact, he's probably been doing it for a very long time, but I want to show you this here. So look at verse number 28. It says this, Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast. Or what, I'm sorry, or that he should give something to the poor. So they're like, okay, we still don't get it. Why, did Jesus, why is Jesus talking to them, right? It never crossed their mind. Well, maybe Jesus is telling, hey, do what you're going to do quickly, right? It never, they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. And look, we're all in that position to some degree. I'm not up here claiming that I can spot the next person that's going to go bad on us. In fact, a lot of times I'm taken by surprise, okay? But the more you study the subject out, the more experience you get with this type of stuff, the better you're going to be. The more you're going to have success in your Christian life. Because one thing that's going to slow you down is when you assume that a friendly is your close friend and they do something that offends you, which we're going to talk about, okay, what happens? You get frustrated. Then what happens? You get bitter. And then what could possibly happen after that? Then you're out of church, okay? And that's exactly what we do not want. Now go back one chapter real quickly to John chapter number uh, 12. I want to show you an example of evil communication. So again, remember, we're reading in chapter 13. They're like, who is it? We don't get it. They don't suspect Judas, okay? But you know the situation here in John 12. They're having a meal. Lazarus is there, right? Martha's there. Mary's there, she's anointing the feet of Jesus. And look at what Mr. Judas has to say. Look at verse number five. He says this, was not this ointment, or why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And of course the narrator lets us know why he says that in verse six. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Now at the time that he's saying this, they don't realize that. They don't know that. They're just like, oh, yeah, you know, he's a one percenter, right? He's a one percenter, you know, so he's got this old IFB mentality, I guess. You understand what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay, right? He's holier than thou. He's the righteous one. Everyone else is terrible but him. Yeah, that type of stuff frustrates me. But you know what? There are people among us that talk like this all the time, right? And here's the thing. We always, always, always want to try edification first. And we always want to pray and hope that people can be restored, right? But we need to know in our hearts which category to put these people. So he's like, why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? If this was an old IFB church, you know, they would have done that. And 99% of you suck, (laughs) 
That's pretty much what he's saying. Turn to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter number 27. And so the point is, this, the reason why you have to be aware of this, the reason why we have to understand how to properly put people in their place is because if we don't, again, it just leads to emotional intoxication. We're an emotional beings, right? We are very emotional people. We need to learn. Look, I'll tell you this right now. Relational intelligence is life management. I'm telling you. You have to work on this. You have to understand this is key to your success. This is part of your success in staying in the Christian fight for the long haul. Because people are going to say, people are going to do things, and you don't always know if they're a Judas. You see, that's, the, that's another scary part about this. You don't always know if they're a Judas or if they're just hanging around the wrong crowd and they've had their manners corrupted, right? That's the hard part. You know, people give red flags all the time, and sometimes, you know what? They hear the right sermon, and they're just like, yeah, okay, I got it. You got me, right? right? And they start to get right, and that's what we hope for. That's what we want. Amen. That's exactly the desired outcome, but unfortunately with frenemies, more often than not, they just keep at it. As soon as you turn around, or just stick that knife in there a little bit, a little subtle jab here, a little subtle jab there. It's like they're on a schedule. You know, I'm going to get you Sunday night, you know, for this month, and then next month I'm going to go on Wednesdays. I'm just going to say something to you. You know, it's like they always have an issue. There's always something wrong with the schedule. There's always something wrong with the soul winning times. They're always confused. And you know what? This type of stuff can drive you absolutely insane if you don't know how to manage these types of people. Okay, and I'll tell you a story here. I learned this the hard way a long time ago. Um, I had this friend, and his name wasn't Jonadab. This was many years ago, okay? This is at work. And, uh, you know, I met this kid. He was a, a Christian, you know, and so I was trying to work on him the best way that I knew how. We were on the same crew, you know, so we kind of had a lot in common. You know, he tells me, well, you know, I wrestled all throughout high school. I'm like, huh, hey, you know, we've got something in common there. You know, I'm going to invite you to my gym, you know, which was by invitation only. I get them to come to my gym. We take them out for dinner. I mean, this relationship's going on. I'm thinking we're friends, right? I'm thinking, you know, I just made a friend here. Our family's got a friend. Well, during the process of time, I notice he starts, you know, just asking me different questions. Like the relationship, like, turned. It went from just what it was to him always asking me, like, how, how are you getting success here? How are you always getting promoted? And, you know, how are you learning this job so well? Blah, blah, blah. And one day, I go away to San Diego, okay? I go away to San Diego for about nine months. I come back, you know, and I figure we're just going to pick up right where we left off. We're back on the same crew. One day, he comes up to me, and he asks me a question. And keep in mind, this is a long time ago, okay? <laughs> long time ago. Still no excuse. But he says, hey, this girl that was down there, what do you think about her? Well, back then, I just said, you know, I think she's a whore. <laughs> she's a whore. What, I mean, I was like, come on, man, you know that. And he's just like oh, yeah, yeah, that's really good, you know, and he kept, like, trying to probe me on this. I felt like something was off, and I was like, you know, I better just shut my mouth right now. Something is not right about this. This dude sprints up to HR and tells on me, okay? So now I'm in big trouble, because you're not supposed to say stuff like that. But luckily, <laughs> I was permanent, and there was nothing that could really happen to me. So they basically suspended me for a day of work, and then what my boss did, literally, I got a promotion, like, the next week, and then they sent me back to San Diego for six months just to hide me while I got the you know, So the joke was on him. But, you know, the whole time I was, I was really hurt. I was like, man, what, what's going on? This type of thing always seems to happen. It seems like I'm investing in people. I meet somebody. It seems like we hit it off. And I'm sure you can relate. You know, and it's like, well, why? Is there something wrong with me? Why am I always the one initiating this? And thinking back, it was always me. You know, I was always the one initiating the conversations and the, the, the friendship. The, so I thought... Turns out he didn't view me the same way that I viewed him. I had certain expectations, right, of reciprocating here. And I was ignorant at, the, at that time, and I couldn't see the signs. When he, uh, the first time I took him to my gym, for example, you know, it was a pretty big deal because my reputation's on the line. I have to invite him because it's by invite only. He quits. He's like, this is too hard. I'm like, too hard? You've got a mouthpiece. You've got pads. You've got headgear. What are you talking about? He's like, yeah, but they punched me in the mouth here, and it hurts. I, what happened to this tough guy? It was all a lie. It was all a facade. He wrestled for like two weeks in high school. Not three years. So be careful when somebody says, oh, I wrestled in high school. How many, what do you mean? You wrestle your friends? On a video game? 
You know, so looking back, you know, there was all kinds of red flags. But the biggest one that I got to tell you is I had placed him in my friend category when I should have placed him in my friendly or my, yeah, yeah, my friendly category. Because if I had done that, maybe I wouldn't have gotten so frustrated. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten so bitter. And again, we can all relate to this because these people are all around us, right? They're all, it, it, it is sad, but it's true. Okay, we need to know how to manage these people. Now, you're there in Proverbs 27. Look at verse number 17. It says this, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Now, turn to Proverbs chapter number 13. Go back a few chapters. Proverbs chapter number 13. Proverbs chapter number 13. So iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. This is why it's important to surround ourselves with steadfast people, like-minded believers, okay? Whether they're in the friendly category, they're in the friend category, it doesn't matter, right? I'm not saying you can't benefit from your associates and your coworkers and your laborers. Of course you could. Of course you will, okay? That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is we need to be careful about the expectations that we place on those that are really just friendlies, those that we're just acquainted with, we're associated with, and so on. And you wanna make sure that those people, by and large, are iron, okay? Or can be iron. Look at verse number 20. You're there in Proverbs 13, look at verse number 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. What does that mean? That means there's no neutral relationships. I had a boss one time tell me this. He said, you know what? He said, association is assimilation. He says, you're going to become like the people that you hang out with the most. And this is when I was a young supervisor working for the federal government. You know, he, he kind of noticed I was kind of getting some advice from the wrong crowd. And he told me that. He said, association is assimilation. He's like, they are going down the wrong path. I know you can't see that right now. He says, but you need to be careful because if you don't, if you don't separate yourself, if you don't basically put them in the proper place, you will become like them. You will run your crew the same way that they do, and it's going to lead to destruction. So we need to understand that. Now, I've got a statement here, and this basically sums up my entire sermon. I'm going to explain it to you. I've made it so it's hopefully easy to remember, uh, to remember but it's, it goes like this. True friends help you progress, but friendlies and frenemies couldn't care less. We need to understand that. This is harsh. I get it. But it's reality. Look, Jesus didn't even treat everyone the exact same, but he treated them right. Right? He had his 12, and then he had his three. But it also talks about how he loved Lazarus. Did he take Lazarus to the mount? Was Lazarus in the Garden of Gethsemane? So we want to be kind. We want to edify everyone. We want to treat everyone right. We want to put people in their proper place, but not everyone gets access. And this is one thing I notice about the frenemies. They, they tend to want to come in and get access to places. Hey, what time do you go to the bank? <laughs> time do you do the drop-offs? It's like, why do you ask this thing seeing it's secret? It's not secret, but it's like, what, you know, you got to kind of ask yourself some, sometimes, like, well, what is it to you? Yeah. We're not that close. Maybe that's what I should have titled the sermon. We're not that close. <laughs> See, it comes later. <laughs> Always comes later. So again, true friends help you progress, but friendlies and frenemies couldn't care less. And what I mean by that, and I, I'm not trying to be mean to those that, that you know, you're going to that are in your association, people that are new that you just met this weekend that you hit it off with, okay? But just, look, this is a good lesson for singles too. Just because a girl says hi to you guys doesn't mean she loves you, <laughs> okay? I just, that's a whole nother sermon, I get it, <laughs> but it needs to be said, all right? Just please, that, that's your bottom line for today, okay? <laughs> Remember that. Go to John chapter 15. Go to John chapter number 15. So again, misplaced people produce misplaced expectations, which leads to frustration and bitterness. There's no neutral relationships. You're not going to hang out with the wrong crowd and say, you know what, I'm going to rub off on them. No, they're going to rub off on you. They outnumber you. They, their evil communication, which is subtle, right? Evil communication doesn't mean that they just come up to you and they say, hey, you're garbage. That's easy. It's the subtlety that's the danger. 
That's why we have to understand how to put people in their proper place. Because some people are very, very good at subtlety. Right? And, you know, as a pastor, this is just something I'm very interested. I've been reading books about this. I've been studying this out. I'm actually going to turn this into a series because I've got so much stuff. It's just blowing my mind. But, I mean, you just see this all the time. All the time. And, you know, as a pastor, it's like I can't just come out in, in the flesh. I want to just be like, just grab people. and just like, look, I know you're a false prophet. Just say it. Just admit it right now. Come on, admit it to me. And just pin them up against the wall and just say it. You know, because I know, but I got no proof. I don't have the, the, the multiple witnesses I need. But inside, man, I know. You know, what you feel is real, but it's not always right, and it's not always the right time, okay? So just keep that in mind. So I've got three points for you this morning, and let's get started here. John chapter 15, look at verse number 12. So Jesus says this. He says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. So notice that there's a condition here on what a friend is. Okay, keep reading. Verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So what is Jesus doing here? He's giving them access. He's giving them access that he wouldn't normally give a servant, that he wouldn't normally give just anyone that he might be just friendly with, good with. Okay, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Verse 17, these things I command you that ye love one another, right? So he's saying, hey, look, I'm counting you my friends, right? Now there's reciprocation here. He's like, obviously he's Jesus. He's the, you know, he knows the heart inside and out. But he's basically saying, hey, I'm transitioning this relationship that we have. This is no longer an associate type relationship. It's still mentor, right? Because he's Jesus. But he's basically saying, hey, I am now giving you access. And part of that is he's calling them friends. So what we need to understand here, and this is my first point, is that true friends are not acquaintances, nor are they associates. Right? Our friendlies, those that we're just cool with, those that we don't know that well, they're not necessarily your true friends, and we don't have to treat them the exact same. Not everyone gets access to everything. Because here's the problem. When you do that, when you give people access that are not your true friends, again, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up to get your heart broken. And look, there's enough evil in a day. There's enough trouble with people regardless of where you're at. You don't need to add to the frustration. Turn to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number four. Ecclesiastes chapter number four. So again, Jesus is saying, hey, he's saying here, hey, friends are transparent. They share personal information back and forth. And he's saying, hey, I haven't hid anything from you. I've made known to you very clearly what to expect, what is going on here, and I'm calling you my friends. But notice there's also a condition here. If you do whatsoever, I command you. So what I want to do now is I just want to give you four just quick things uh, that basically highlight what a true friend is, okay? Because this is important for us to know in order to properly place people in our lives. So Ecclesiastes chapter number four, look at verse number nine. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Verse 10, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Okay, what do you see here? Encouragement. You see the necessity for friends. Now, obviously, you, you that are married, that's the number one relationship. That's the number one friendship is your spouse, okay? So I'm not saying guys go home to your man caves and just get, you know, work on getting those manly friendships and, and you're good to go. You don't, you, you, know, you don't need your spouse like a friend. No, of, of course you do, okay? Different subject here. But a true friend is going to encourage, and this needs to go both ways. Now, does that mean you can't encourage the friendlies? Does that mean you can't encourage the associates in your life? The acquaintances? No, of course not. What's the threefold mission of the church? It's to edify, it's to evangelize, and it's to eliminate the enemy from among us. That's what it is. So look, if I just met you yesterday, 
I'd do anything for you. I would help you. If somebody was picking on you, I, mean, I would take your side. I would, I would, I would say you're a friend. Uh, you know, no problems. We don't have any problems. But at the same time, I'm not going to extend myself the same way I would necessarily for a true friend because you don't know much about me. I don't know much about you, but we're good, right? Relationships take work. And part of that work is encouragement. So you need to pay attention to this. If you're always the one encouraging someone and maybe they're not doing it back to you and you think, man, what's going on with me? What's wrong with me? Why does this always seem to happen to me? It's probably because they just want to remain in that friendly category. Not everybody wants to be our friends. Not everybody wants to be our true friends. And you just got to be okay with that. Right. It's fine to have a ton of, you know, friends or people like we have in this room. But look, just, let's just be honest. We can't be close friends with 400 people. That's just not going to happen. But we don't realize that oftentimes. And we misplace our expectations on people. And when they don't reciprocate, when they don't return, then all of a sudden, oh, you got a problem with me. You got a problem with me? How come you didn't invite me to the trampoline park? <laughs> you got a problem? Yeah, I do, but I'm not going to tell you about it now. I don't have to. You're not that close to me. <laughs> okay? Now, does that mean I'm not going to help you go soul winning? Of course I am. Does that not, I mean, if you have a need financially and I've got the means to meet it, I'll meet it. But that doesn't mean we are that close. So number one is encouragement. Go to Proverbs chapter number 17. Proverbs chapter number 17. And another thing too is if this is just going one way, it could just be a mentor-mentee relationship, which I, you know, I don't have time to get into that. That's going to have to come in a couple weeks, but just keep that in mind, encouragement, and it needs to go both ways. That's how you kind of decide, like, is this person moving to the friend category where I can open up more, give maybe more access, is when you start to see these things going both ways. Pay attention to that. Here's the next one, Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Well, you know what? Inside your churches, you got lots of brothers and sisters, and some of them, you're just going to have some adversity with. But you can minimize that. You can minimize the offense when you understand how to properly place them. But the beginning part of that verse there, a man, I'm sorry, a friend loveth at all times. You know what that is? What is that? That is loyalty. That is loyalty. This is a big one for me. This is a very, very big one for me. Loyalty. It's something that is disappearing from the earth at an alarming rate. Right. Loyalty. Yeah. Look, I asked Pastor Thompson if I could, I could tell this story, and you might think, oh, you're trying to open up old ones? No. So a couple, was about a month ago, right, he calls me and says, hey, these two preacher guys have been talking some trash about me. You know what I said? I said, now they've got a problem with me. Yeah. Yeah. But before that, they were in my friendly category, in my associate category. I immediately moved them to the frenemy category. Right. Amen. Now you have a problem with me. And here's the thing. I don't really know those two guys very well. But let's just, for example, let's just say this. Let's just say I had more in common with them. Let's just say maybe they were vets. They were into the same stuff I was. And maybe, you know, they, yeah, I don't have that same stuff, you know, in common with Pastor Thompson. I'm still taking his side because I've already decided he's my friend. Right? We've, we've, we've known each other for like five, six years now. He's all, we've already proven to each other that this is a real friendship. So it doesn't matter. I'm not going to sacrifice that just because I might have one thing or two things or even 20 things in common with these other two people. Yeah. If you've got a problem with my friends, then you have a problem with me. Yeah. And that's how it is. And I've got another example I'm going to give you later. Okay? But what we see today is we see people and they're just like all over the place getting hurt. Look, I remember when that whole... Adam Fannin and the whole, you know, what's that guy's Chuck Morgan, Chad Morgan thing went down. <laughs> I just thought, this is why I nickname everybody, because I really am terrible with names. It doesn't matter, though. Right? I remember this guy in my church. I, I got to have a meeting with you. Great. This guy's got tears rolling down his cheeks, dripping off of his chin. Because he's like, here were my friends. And the things that were said were just mean. It's like, what? They don't know you. They don't love you at all times. You, I was like, oh, man. 
That's how, this, that's how these types of things get born. You're crying over people that don't even know your name. It's like people that cry when their favorite sports team loses. They're not your friends. You don't get those millions of dollars. This dude's crying. And he's like, I just, I just think it's so bad when we reprobate everybody. Oh, there you go. He's a one percenter now. And he actually is a one percenter now. He, he let me know several times on YouTube and Facebook. And you know what they do? They go and change their little account, but they type the same. <laughs> Say the same stupid things they said when you knew them. Let you know. But loyalty. Look, if you got a problem with Verity Baptist Church, you've got a problem with me. Yeah. I don't care if we work together every day, 10 hour shifts. We got a problem. Yep. And until you apologize to my friends, it's on. Look, I'm all about trying to live peaceably with all men, but I'm not about sacrificing my friendships with people. That's not going to happen. You know, people will, oh, that's pretty mean what you said about Michael Johnson. How could you as a pastor say that? Because I said some stuff. Because, you know, Pastor Mejia's church building gets blown up in this clown, Temple of the Dog Baptist Church. Yeah, yeah. you know, there's a hunger strike over there. <laughs> Who's from the 90s? Anybody grow up close to Seattle? You know what I'm talking about. Right? I said some stuff about that, thanks to Dylan, the Vancouver villain. You know, <laughs> I'm typing my sermon up, and he sends me this clip of him saying basically he deserved that. Wow. I was like, ooh. Wow. I'm like, oh, now, now, it's, now it's on. You know? And all he does is send me a message, you're ashamed. You're an idiot. You're weak. You're pathetic is what you are. You're a dirtbag. To side with a bunch of filthy faggots over a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. But I'm the bad guy. I'm the terrible one. Oh, you mean? You're never going to build relationships like that. I know how to properly place people. And through trial and error and a lot of heartache. So a friend loveth at all times. At all times. That's loyalty. Look, we need that. But that's what you need to be looking for in these people in your life. Can you sniff out any kind of loyalty? If you can't, that doesn't mean you reprobate them, doesn't mean you write them off, right? You just understand, look, I'm going to invest a little bit more and I'm not going to expect anything in return. It's going to save you so much trouble and so much pain in your life, I promise you. Go to Proverbs chapter 18. So we've got encouragement, we've got loyalty, Proverbs 18, 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You know what that, you know what that means? Unshakable reliability. Those who you call your friends, those who you assume are your close friends, do they meet these qualifications? Can you see that in these people? Or are they always shifting? Well, I just like to be friends with everybody. I, I don't like to, you know... Look, I like to draw the line in the sand. I'm old school. You talk trash in my friend. Let's, 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 let's bring it then. Let's go. I'm not talking physical. I'm not talking about beating people up physically. But I'm just talking about the fact that you need to draw the line. You need to put people in their place where they belong. And look, this is key to preserving your friend. Look, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Look, so you need to be friendly to your friends. And when people talk trash about them, you don't go preach for them. Am I the only one that thinks that? <laughs> I mean, where's your loyalty at? Yeah, right. Oh, you don't have any. Yeah, right. That's the problem. Yeah. Unshakable reliability. Yep. That's a good characteristic of a friend. Yeah. Go to Proverbs 27. Proverbs chapter 27. Look at verse number six. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And the old man, that flesh, is always geared towards the kisses of the enemy. That's what these frenemies like to do. Oh, you know, that was, you're, you're, you're really great. Right? And then 10 minutes later, they're telling someone else in the church just something very subtle about you. That was good, but he could have said this and that. Right. How about you just shut your mouth? Right. Is that too much to ask? <laughs> Apparently so for some people. Shut your mouth. So what do we see here? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know what that says? That says honesty. 
right? He, we don't want to get sucked into the Ahab syndrome where we just call up all the false prophets that are going to tell us what we want to hear. Yeah. Right? We want that friend that's going to say, hey, you got something on your face. <laughs> your shoe's untied. That doesn't fit you. Because a true friend cares. They want to encourage you. They care about how you're viewed by other people. Amen. They care about you. They're going to tell you things. Yeah, I believe in peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. But they're honest. You know, a lot of times we can't just get all these things. Encouragement, uh, loyalty, unshakable reliability, honesty. It's really hard to gauge those just from a few meetings. Right. That's why I say, guys, when a girl says hi, it's not instant love. You know, save that for the Hollywood crowd. You know, love at first sight. Okay, that's, a, that's rare. But it's also rare in friendships. You just got to be careful at letting people too close to you that haven't proven these things. And there's nothing wrong with that. Friendships take, look, marriage takes work. Why would you think that friendships don't take work? It takes work to get friends. You need to be careful. You need to develop discernment. Do these people display any of these attributes or even can they? Okay, that's what we do about this. We go back and we look and we say, you know, why am I frustrated? Why am I frustrated with these people? Is it me? Partially, yes, because maybe you're misplacing these people in your life. You're counting them as true friends, but they're not feeling the same way about you. They, and again, they might not be bad. But the expectation is wrong. They're not going to reciprocate these things to you. You might, look, they might even pour their heart out to you. That doesn't mean they're your true, close friends. Go back to John 15. John 15. All right, look at verse number 15. We'll move on here. It says this, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And so the second point, I've been hinting at it all morning, is this. We don't engage the friendlies the same way we do the friends. You have to understand this. I get it. It sounds terrible. It sounds harsh. But it has to be this way in order for you to properly manage things. So it's so easy for us to get this mixed up. I get it. Because you meet people, you have the same thing in common, you have the same goals. Maybe you know, you're both saved. You got all this stuff in common. Right? But again, do you really know these people? To, enough to give them access. And when we get these things mixed up, man, that's when the trouble begins, okay? These types of relationships, the friendlies, the associates, the coworkers, the co-laborers, there's nothing wrong with those. You're gonna have more of those than you will close friends. Nothing wrong with that at all. The problem is you just gotta realize it's an unbalanced relationship, right? Which is good. That's good for us because that gives us practice. That opens us up and it frees us up to actually be able to take on that mentor role. Don't be afraid to pour in some stuff to those people. Don't be afraid to edify them. Don't be afraid to help them out. Don't be afraid to love them like Jesus loved Lazarus, like he loved a lot of people. Don't be afraid of that at all. Just don't expect anything in return because that is when you're going to get your heart broken. Don't expect the same exchange with those people. Now turn to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. Just to kind of show you what this looks like. You know, I see this from time to time where and I'm actually watching this unfold right now, where somebody might have, let's say, a baby shower, okay? I'm going to throw a baby shower, or they're going to throw a bridal shower, or a birthday party at the trampoline park or something, and not invite certain people in the church. Guess what usually happens? I got to have a meeting with you. I got to have a meeting with you, pastor. We got to have a talk. So-and-so's got some beef with me. Really? Well, what's going on? Well, they didn't invite me to their bridal shower. They didn't take me to the trampoline park. I think there's a problem. Yeah, the problem's with you. <laughs> Are they your friends? Do they have to? Do they have to tell you why? Why do you think that they have to tell you why they didn't invite you? 
Do you think they hate you? I don't know. I just thought you should know. You see what I'm talking about? That situation right there, what they're trying to do is pit people against each other. But it all stems because they viewed those people as their close, true friends. And they weren't. They're not bad. They're just, they just don't view you the same way that you viewed them. And trying to tell people, no, they got a problem. You got to do something about this. I don't have to do anything. Make me. You know, sometimes you got to tell people that. Make me. Because these, these people, it's like they, they all of a sudden come up with these crazy demands and they want to hold you hostage. And this is why you want to be careful and not dump more than you can afford to expend in your friendlies and especially in the frenemies. You want to treat them right, but you don't have to give them access. You don't have to treat them the same. I don't care what anybody says. You, don't, you can invite whoever you want to to the bridal shower, the baby shower, the party, the trampoline park that you paid for. That is your right, and you don't even have to feel bad for it. Unless you're the frenemy who is doing it to, to purposely mess with people. That's a whole other subject, okay? So let's move on here. The application here is simple. Don't make the mistake of investing too much time in the friendlies. Don't sacrifice your friends, your true friends, for those who are just your associates, who are just your coworkers, who are just your co-laborers. Still treat them right, still invest in them, but don't overextend yourself because you're gonna fall down. You're gonna fall down. It, I see it happen all the time, all the time. You're there in 1 Kings chapter number two. So we're gonna move on to my third point here. So the Bible says this in verse five. So this is David giving instruction here to Solomon before he passes on. And he says this, Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and unto Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom, and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace. Now jump ahead, if you would, to verse number 28. It says this, Then tidings came to Joab, for Joab had turned after Adonijah, though he turned not after Absalom. And Joab fled unto the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold on the horns of the altar. Stop right there and just think about this for a second. Joab was family to David. He'd been with David for a long time. When Absalom turned on David, Joab didn't turn on David. So what happened? What changed? Why did he go against the grain? Why did he go uh, go against the plan? And all of a sudden now I'm going to side with Adonijah. It's because he got frustrated and because he got bitter. It's because he misplaced expectations. See, David kept him in the friend zone, in the friendly zone. Because of what he did to Abner, because of what he did to Amasa, and other things as well. And wouldn't give him certain access. And at the end of his life, he got tired of it. He got sick of it, and he finally had a choice to make. And that is very, very important to what we're talking about here. So look at the end of that verse there. And Joab fled into the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold of the horns of the altar. So now it's clear. You say, why, why, why bring this up here? What is the big deal about this? Here's the problem. This guy had a choice to make. Why do you see this all throughout the Bible? Just for example, why, why do you read about, okay, when Jehu was going after Jezebel, he looked up and said to the eunuchs, hey, who's on my side? Throw her down. Why did Moses, when he came down from the mount, said, who's on the Lord's side? This is important to understanding my second point, actually. Why? Because choice reveals priorities. Choice reveals priorities. So when he, when Joab sided with Adonijah, David was like, okay, I see where his priorities are now. Same thing when Jehu said, hey, who's on my side? Throw her down. So, okay, I see where your priorities are. They're with me. I see where your loyalty's at. You need to pay attention to the choices that people make in certain situations. This is going to help you to properly place these people, to not misplace them. This is very important. And this is a thing that goes overlooked because we want to be, oh, I just want to love everybody the same. And then, 
It doesn't work. Just get over it. It doesn't work. And I told you I had another example for you. I'm not going to mention this person's name because he took this post down. But I'm going to read it for you. Okay? So Pastor Menes preached a sermon about Christians fighting. It was a great sermon. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to it. Okay? This guy on Facebook watches the sermon, and this is what he says. I've been blessed by Pastor Mena's ministry since 2017, but his sermon on Christian fighting is stupid. Pastor McMurtry has not told me to stop listening to the new IFB. He doesn't have to when stupid sermons like this are preached. I came to LBC on the way to Faithful Word Baptist Church, but I liked it better here. Okay, this individual here, he had a choice to make when he heard that sermon. And if you didn't agree, the best thing to do for edification reasons would be to shut your mouth. That's right. We don't need to see your Facebook post. Yeah. The second thing when I saw that, it's like, now you got a problem with me. Yeah. You say, well, what's the big deal with that? Look, I'll raise more hell than you can put out with two fire departments once you get me going. <laughs> I don't like people messing with my friends. It pisses me off. Yeah. And it should bother all of you. Yeah. We need to instill loyalty in our people. Think I'm kidding, but it, look, this is, this is one thing I look out for all the time. You can ask the guys that go to my church. I'm always watching when something happens. What side are you going to be on? What choices do you make? Because that reveals to me your priorities. Is it with the church and the mission, or is it with something else? Is your, are your priorities with playing stupid games every Saturday, every Sunday, every time we have a church function? You got a problem? Because it's all about you, I see where your priorities are. And now I know how to properly place you. But what often happens? They get frustrated, they get better. Why don't you let me in? It's because, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you, you don't belong in. Not everybody gets access. Go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter number 9. I'm getting close to being done. Mark chapter number 9. After this, we're going to go back to Matthew 26 real quick. Mark chapter 9, look at verse number 2. We're going to add a couple passages here. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Now go back, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26. So what do we see here? Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountain of transfiguration, and he shows them things. They get access, if you will. Keep that in mind. Look at Matthew chapter number 26, verse 37. Matthew 26, verse 37. It says this, And he took with him, so this is Jesus, and Jesus says, And he took with him Peter, and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So here's the deal. When you add these two passages up, you have Jesus to Peter, James, and John at his highest, at his highest point. Right? He's transfigured before them. So they're with him there in his high point. What do you have in Matthew 26? We well, have Peter, James, and John with Jesus at his low point in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here's point number three. You bring in people whose character reveals that they are safe and can handle you at your highs and your lows. You got that? You need to bring people into your inner circle that can handle you at your highs and handle you at your lows. Look, Jesus is God. I mean, he is perfect. We need to study how he managed people. It's a lie to say we have to treat everyone the exact same. Because that's not what he did here. Here's what relational discernment is going to do for you. Because as I was studying, I was like, why... You know, what am I going to say? What, what could the critic say about this, about this point? You know, like, like what, what, what's the reason? Why did he just take the three? Well, here's the thing. It doesn't tell you, does it? Here's an interesting thing about that. 
Relational discernment releases you from the obligation to explain to everyone why they don't have access to your life. <laughs> He's the ultimate boss. You say, why isn't it in there? Why did he do it? That doesn't tell us. It's because he's like, I don't have to tell you. I'm released from that obligation, and that's how you need to be. I don't need to explain to you why I didn't take you to the trampoline park. Maybe you have a lust problem. I don't know. I don't have to tell you why, but I'll still treat you right because you, you haven't been given the boot yet. I'm still going to treat you right, but I'm not going to place you as my true friend because you haven't proven encouragement. You haven't proven loyalty. You haven't proven that unshakable reliability. You haven't proven honesty. In fact, you haven't proven a whole lot. Like I said, a lot of these people are like goats. Oh, but I tithe, but I give more. And they like to let you know that so they can control you. Don't let people make you feel like you have to tell them why you do things with certain people and not them. I'm not even saying you got to be rude about it. Jesus didn't tell anybody. He just did it. And that's exactly how we need to be. But obviously, these three were safe. Think about that. Jesus wept in John chapter 11 when Lazarus died. But you don't see him in the mountain here. You didn't see him in the Garden of Gethsemane. It doesn't mean he's a bad guy. We don't know the, the, the full deal. Jesus treated him right. But the point is, we all have an inner circle and we don't have to feel guilty about letting people in. There are people at my church that I'm closer to than others. I still love them all. I still want to edify them. I still want to help them. I'd still give them whatever. I want to build them up. And I'm always willing to let more people come in. But look, man, there's some boundaries that got to be set the, initially. You know, there's, there's some criteria that you have to meet in order to get into that. And if you don't meet that, it's not my fault. It's your fault, not mine. I had a guy one time, well, you know, I, I, sh I, th you know, I think we should all go to the bank. <laughs> Don't you think? Why? What is the deal with the bank? <laughs> Come to find out later, it's because he was a thief. It's because he thought I was in this for the money. And thinking back, like, why, would he say, why are we saying stuff like that? Or here's another one. How much money do you make? Why do you ask seeing the thing is secret? You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't need to tell you that. And here's another thing, another little, just a, another little key. You know, be careful when people are like overly impressed when you're at your highs and people that are not overly disappointed at your lows. That can be a big problem. Not saying you got to like attack them right away, but just keep these things in mind. And so I'm about done here. I'm going to wrap this up here. I just want to give you just a, a real quick application here. You know, if, if you're in this boat, and it, maybe if you're not now, you, you might find yourself in the future. Take the people that you think are your friends, and you're, like, struggling with this. You're just like, why am I always, like, reaching out to them, but they're not coming back to me? And just write down some things in a private book that you can keep tucked away, and just write down some of these things. Are they encouraging? Are they honest? Do they have that unshakable reliability? You know, are they, all, all these different things that we've talked about, write these things down. And put them in their proper place. Set up that boundary so that you don't wind up getting your heart broken, so that you don't wind up getting frustrated and bitter and backslidden out of church. See it all the time. I thought they were my friend. I don't know if I could keep, I don't, I don't know if I could keep coming here because they're here. I hear that one a lot, too. It's like, why? Well, they don't feel the same way about me as I feel about them. Again, that is your fault because you don't have relational discernment. And I'm telling you right now, relational discernment is life management. And look, it's up to us to steward our lives. So I'm just saying step back and just think about it. Think about these people who you think are your true friends. It doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't necessarily mean they're enemies but they might just be bad for you. That chemistry just might not be there. That's okay. You could still do the same mission. You could still go soloing with them. You could still work with them. You could still love them. You could still pour into them as long as you've got your expectations properly aligned. You will not suffer the emotional damage that so many people suffer. All because they just, they meet somebody. Oh, I got a new best friend. 
oh, this is my new best friend right here. What? You know that dude for like five minutes? You've been, you've been coming to our church for two weeks and already this is your best friend? You could have picked somebody better than that guy, for sure. That is for sure. And so that's what I would leave you with. Take some time to think about the people in your life and properly put them in their place. And don't feel guilty about it. You can't manage 400 people. You're not going to manage 45 people. And you don't owe anybody an explanation. Amen. Relational intelligence, well, I'm telling you, it's going to save you. It's going to save your children. It's going to save these teens a lot of heartache. And the ultimate goal is that we don't get frustrated and bitter and out of church. Because we all see this all the time. And this is a big, big factor in preservation. Getting people on track. Look, you got to put them in the place. They get offended, so be it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for revealing this truth. I just pray that you'd all help us to increase our discernment, Lord, in our relationships and help us to properly place people in our lives to, to better edify them, Lord, and to, to better edify the body of Christ. I just pray you bless Pastor Shelley, Lord, and I just pray that you bless the fellowship and all the events that go on this weekend, Lord, and thank you again for this opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.